Hello again, thanks for joining us here for our chapter book story time at the Caribou Public Library in Caribou, Maine. I'm Miss Erin and I'm so glad that you're here with us. We are going to be continuing the story of Dr. Doolittle by Hugh Lofting. We're on chapters 18 and 19 today. So getting really close to the end actually, just a few more days left of reading. Let's go ahead and see what happens. It's chapter 18 is called Smells. Our uncle must now be found, said the doctor. That is the next thing, now that we know that he wasn't thrown into the sea. Then Dab Dab came up to him again and whispered, Ask the eagles to look for the man. No living creature can see better than an eagle. When they are hot, miles high in the air, they can count the ants crawling on the ground. Ask the eagles. So the doctor sent one of the swallows off to get some eagles. And in about an hour, the little bird came back with six different kinds of eagles. A black eagle, a bald eagle, a fish eagle, a golden eagle, an eagle vulture, and a white-tailed sea eagle. Twice as high as the, boys they, as the boy they were, each one of them. And they stood on the rail of the ship like round-shouldered soldiers, all in a row, stern and still and stiff. While their great gleaming black eyes shot darting glances here and there and everywhere. Gub Gub was scared of them and got behind the barrel. He said he felt as though those terrible eyes were looking right inside of him to see what he'd stolen for lunch. And the doctor said to the eagles, a man has been lost, a fisherman with red hair and an anchor marked on his arm. Would you be so kind as to see if you can find him for us? This boy is the man's nephew. Eagles do not talk very much. And all they answered in their husky voices was, you may be sure we will do our best for John Doolittle. Then they flew off and Gub Gub came out from behind his barrel to see them go. Up and up and up they went higher and higher and higher still. Then when the doctor could only just see them, they parted company and started going off all different ways, north, east, south, and west, looking like tiny grains of black sand creeping across the wide blue sky. My gracious, said Gub Gub in a hushed voice, what a height. I don't wonder they scorched their feathers so near to the sun. They were gone a long time, and when they came back, it was almost night. And the eagle said to the doctor, We have searched all the seas and all the countries and all the islands and all the cities and all the villages in the half of this world. Oh, in this half of the world. But we have failed. In the main street of Gibraltar, we saw three dark, three red hairs lying on a wheelbarrow before the baker's door. They were not the hairs of a man, they were the hairs of a fur coat. Nowhere on land or water could we see any sign of this boy's uncle. And if we could not see him, then he is not to be seen. For John Doolittle, we have done our best. Then the six great birds flapped their big wings and flew back to their homes in the mountains and the rocks. Well, said Dab Dab, -dab after they'd gone, what are we going to do now? The boy's uncle must be found. There's no two ways about that. The lad isn't old enough to be knocking around the world by himself. Boys aren't like ducklings. They have to be taken care of until they're quite old. I wish Chi-Chi were here. He would find the man. Good old Chi-Chi. Wonder how he's getting on. If we only had Polynesia with us, said the white mouse, she would soon think of some way. Do you remember how she got us all out of prison the second time? My, but she was a clever one. Don't think so much of these eagle fellows, said Jip. They're just conceited. They may have very good eyesight and all that, but when, when you ask them to find a man for you, they can't do it. They have a cheek. They have the cheek to come back and say that nobody else could do it. They're just conceited, like that collie in Puddleby. And I don't think a whole lot of those gossipy old porpoises either. All they could tell us was that the man isn't in the sea. We don't know, want to know where he isn't want to know where he is. Oh, don't talk so much, said Gub Gub. It's easy to talk, but it isn't so easy to find a man when you've got a whole world to hunt him in. Maybe the fisherman's hair has turned white, worrying about the boy, and that was why the eagles didn't find him. You don't know everything. You're just talking. You are not doing anything to help. You couldn't find the boy's uncle any more than the eagles could. You couldn't do as well. Couldn't I? said the dog. That's all you know, you stupid piece of warm bacon. I haven't begun to try yet, have I? You wait and see. Then Jip went to the doctor and said, Ask the boy if he has anything in his pockets that belonged to his uncle. 
will you please? So the doctor asked him, and the boy showed them a gold ring that he wore on a piece of string around his neck because it was too big for his finger. He said his uncle gave it to him when they saw the pirates coming. Jip smelled the ring and said, that's no good. Ask him if he has anything else that belonged to his uncle. Then the boy took from his pocket a great big red handkerchief and said, this was my uncle's too. Soon as the boy pulled it out, Jip shouted, snuff by jingo, black rappy snuff. Don't you smell it? His uncle took snuff, ask him doctor. The doctor questioned the boy again and he said, yes, my uncle took a lot of snuff. That's what they use in uh, tobacco when they, yeah, tobacco. <laughs> Fine, said the Jip, said Jip. The man's as good as found. Twill be as easy as stealing milk from a kitten. Tell the boy I'll find his uncle for him in less than a week. Let's go upstairs and see which way the wind is blowing. But it's dark now, said the doctor. You can't find him in the dark. I don't need any light to look for a man who smells of black rappy snuff, said Jip as he climbed the stairs. But the man had a hard smell like string now or hot water. It would be different but snuff, tut tut. Does, does hot water have a smell? asked the doctor. <laughs> Certainly has, said Jip. Hot water smells quite different from cold water. It is warm water or ice that has a really difficult smell. Why, I once followed a man for 10 miles on a dark night by the smell of the hot water he had used to shave with, for the poor fellow had no soap. Now then, let us see which way the wind is blowing. Wind is very important in long distance smelling. It mustn't be too fierce a wind, and of course it must blow the right way. A nice steady damp breeze is the best of all. Ha! This wind is from the north. When Jip went up to the front of the ship and smelled the wind, he started muttering to himself, Tar, Spanish onions, kerosene, wet raincoats, crushed laurel leaves, rubber burning, lace curtains being washed, no, no, my mistake, lace curtains hanging out to dry, and foxes, hundreds of them, cubs, and can you really smell all those different things in the wind? asked the doctor. Why, of course, said Jip, and those are only a few of the easy smells, the strong ones. Any mongrel could smell those with a cold in the head. Wait now, and I'll tell you some of the harder scents that are coming on this wind, a few of the dainty ones. Then the dog shut his eyes tight, poked his nose straight up in the air, and sniffed hard with his mouth half open. <laughs> Oh, here's a picture of the animals talking about how he should be able to smell and figure it out. Here's the push me pull you. Can you see the two heads? One here and one over here. Hmm. Hmm. All right. <clears throat> For a long time, he said nothing. He kept as still as a stone. He hardly seemed to be breathing at all, and when at last he began to speak, it sounded almost as though he were singing sadly in a dream. Bricks, he whispered very low, old yellow bricks, crumbling with age in a garden wall, the sweet breath of young cows standing in a mountain stream, the lead roof of a dovecote, or perhaps a granary with the midday sun on it, black kid gloves lying in a bureau drawer of walnut wood, a dusty road with a horse's drinking trough beneath the sycamores, little mushrooms bursting through the rotting leaves, and, and, any parsnips? asked Gub Gub. No, said Jip, you always think of things to eat. No parsnips whatsoever. And no snuff. Plenty of pipes and cigarettes and a few cigars, but no snuff. We must wait until the wind changes to the south. Yes, it's a poor wind, that, said Gub Gub. I think you're a fake, Jip. Who ever heard of finding a man in the middle of the ocean just by smell? I told you you couldn't do it. Look here, said Jip, getting really angry. You're going to get a bite on the nose in a minute. You needn't think that just because the doctor won't let, won't let us give you what you deserve that you can be as cheeky as you like. Stop quarreling, said the doctor. Stop it. Life's too short. Tell me, Jip, where do you think those smells are coming from? From Devon and Wales, most of them, said Jip. The wind is coming that way. Well, well, said the doctor. You know, that's really quite remarkable. Quite. I must make a note of that for my new book. I wonder if you could train me to a smell as well as that. But no, perhaps I'm better off the way I am. 
Nuff is as good as a feast, they say. Let's go down to the supper. I let's go down to supper. I'm quite hungry. So am I, said Gub Gub. <laughs> now on to the 19th chapter, which is called The Rock. Up they got early the next morning out of the silken beds, and they saw that the sun was shining brightly and that the wind was blowing from the south. Jip smelled the south wind for half an hour. Then he came to the doctor, shaking his head. I smell no snuff as yet, he said. We must wait until the wind changes to the east. But even when the east wind came the, at three o'clock that afternoon, the dog could not catch the smell of snuff. The little boy was terribly disappointed and began to cry again, saying that no one seemed to be able to find his uncle for him. But all Jip said to the doctor was, tell him that when the wind changes to the west, I'll find his uncle, even though he may be in China, so long as he is still taking black rappy snuff. Three days they had to wait before the west wind came. This was on a Friday morning, early, just as it was getting light. A fine rainy mist lay on the sea like a thin fog, and the wind was soft and warm and wet. As soon as Jip woke, he ran upstairs and poked his nose in the air. Then he got most frightfully excited and rushed down again to wake the doctor up. Doctor, he cried, I've got it. Doctor, doctor, wake up. Listen, I've got it. The wind's from the west and it smells of nothing but snuff. Come upstairs and start the ship, quick. There he is, trying to wake up the doctor. <laughs> so the doctor tumbled out of bed and went to the rudder to steer the ship. Now I'll go up to the front, said Jip, and you watch my nose. Whichever way I point it, you turn the ship the same way. <clears throat> the man cannot be far off with the smell as strong as this. <clears throat> the wind's all lovely and wet. Now watch me. So all that morning, Jip stood in the front part of the ship, sniffing the wind and pointing the way for the doctor to steer, while all the animals and the little boy stood under with their eyes wide open, or stood around with their eyes wide open, watching the dog in wonder. About lunchtime, Jip asked Dab Dab to tell the doctor that he was getting worried and wanted to speak to him. So Dab Dab went and fetched the doctor from the other end of the ship. Jip said to him, the boy's uncle is starving. We must make the ship go as fast fast as we can. How do you know he's starving? asked the doctor. Because there is no other smell in the west wind but snuff, said Jip. If a man were cooking or eating food of any kind, I would be bound to smell it too, but he hasn't even fresh water to drink. All he is taking is snuff in large pinches. We are getting nearer to him all the time because the smell grows stronger every minute. But... Make the ship go as fast as you can, for I am certain that the man is starving. <laughs> Here is Jip, sniffing the wind with his nose in the air. All right, said the doctor. <clears throat> and he sent Dab Dab to ask the swallows to pull the ship, the same as they had done when the pirates were chasing them. So the stout little birds came down and once more harnessed themselves to the ship. And now the boat was bounding through the waves at a terrible speed. It went so fast that the fishes in the sea had to jump for their lives to get out of the way and not be run over. And all the animals got tremendously excited and they gave up looking at Jip and turned to watch the sea in front to spy out any land or islands where the starving man might be. But hour after hour went by and still the ship went rushing on over the same flat, flat sea and no land anywhere came in sight. And now the animals gave up chattering and sat around silent anxious and miserable. The little boy again grew sad, and on Jip's face there was a worried look. At last, late in the afternoon, just as the sun was going down, the owl, Tutu, who was perched on the tip of the mast, suddenly started them all by crying out at the top of his voice, Jip, Jip, I see a great, great rock in front of us. Look way out there where the sky and the water meet. See the sun shine on it like gold. Is the smell coming from there? Jip called back, yes, that's it. That is where the man is at last, at last. And when they got near, they could see that the rock was very large, as large as a big field. No trees grew on it, no grass, nothing. The great rock was as smooth and as bare as the back of a tortoise. Then the doctor sailed the ship right around the rock, but nowhere on it could a man be seen. All the animals screwed up their eyes and looked as hard as they could. And John Doolittle got a, little teles got a telescope from downstairs not one living thing could they spy, not even a gull or a starfish 
or a shred of seaweed. They all stood still and listened, straining their ears for any sound. But the only noise they heard was the gentle lapping of the little waves against the side of their ship. Then they all started calling, hello, hello there, hello, till their voices were hoarse, but only an echo came back from the rock. And the little boy burst into tears and said, I'm afraid I shall never see my uncle anymore. What shall I tell them when I get home? But Jip called to the doctor. He must be there. He must. He must. The smell goes on no further. He must be there, I tell you. Sail the ship close to the rock and let me jump out on it. So the doctor brought the ship as close as he could and let down the anchor. Then he and Jip got out of the ship and onto the rock. Jip at once put his nose down close to the ground and began to run all over the place. Up and down he went, back and forth, zigzagging, twisting, doubling and turning, and everywhere he went, the doctor ran behind him close at his heels until he was terribly out of breath. At last, Jip got out a great bark and sat down. And when the doctor came running up to him, he found the dog staring into a big, deep hole in the middle of the rock. The boy's uncle is down there, said Jip quietly. No wonder those silly eagles couldn't see him. It takes a dog to find a man. So the doctor got down into the hole, which seemed to be a kind of cave or tunnel, running a long way under the ground. Then he struck a match and started to make his way along the dark passage, with Jip following behind. The doctor's match soon went out, and he had to strike another and another and another. At last the passage came to an end, and the doctor himself found himself in the kind of tiny room with walls and rock. No, the doctor found himself in a kind of tiny room with walls of rock. And there in the middle of the room, his head resting on his arms, lay a man with, a, with very red hair, fast asleep. Jim went up and sniffed at something lying on the ground beside him. The doctor stooped and picked it up. It was an enormous snuff box and it was full of black rappy snuff. <laughs> they found the uncle, must be. All right, we'll start up again next time. We'll see you soon, bye.